Welcome to the lecture, Caring Enough to Resist, Feminism for the 99% and the Feminism of the New Class Struggles. Please welcome our tonight's guest, Titi Bhattacharya. My name is Anna Vilenica. I will be your moderator tonight. The format of this evening will be as follows. After my short introduction, you will hear the lecture by our guest, following by Q&A session where you will uh, have the opportunity to comment and ask questions. Before I give the word to our guest, I would like to make an announcement. The Croatian translation of the manifesto just went out of the print. It's the F Feminism for the 99% uh, manifesto. It was translated by Karolina Hrga and Martin Beroš. Uh, and, <laughs> and it was published by four associations that tells a lot about the situation in Croatian publishing regarding such uh, books. Those are Multimedia Institute, Institute for Political Ecology, Association White Wave, and the Center for Women's Studies. And you can pick up your copy uh, outside at the entrance of Kino Europa. Now, I would like to tell you a few words about tonight's guests. Titi Bhattacharya is an Associate Professor of History and the Director of Global Studies at Purdue University. She has been writing about South Asian history, and her first book, The Sentience of Culture, Class, Education, and the Colonial Intellectual in Bengal, looks at the processes of class formation and nation formation by focusing on Bengali middle class history. And she is currently writing a book about the history of fear in colonial Bengal. She also writes extensively uh, on Marxist theory, gender, and the politics of Islamophobia. She became well known as one of the organizers of women's strikes in 2017 in the US after the election of Donald Trump. She has been talking, uh, taking an active role in rearticulation of Marxist thought through the lens of social reproduction theory. Her edited collection, Ma Mapping Social Reproduction Theory, contributed to centering um, current feminist debates around issues regarding reproduction of people. This approach has been criticized both within and outside Marxist and uh, feminist field. For instance, yesterday we had a chance to hear Michael Henrik's dismissal of this approach from Marxist position. In his opinion, patriarchy is to blame for uh, unequal position of women. He, had, he tends to see women as a reserve labor force and not as a reproductive worker. On the other hand, this approach has been criticized uh, as an attempt to use an analytical tool, which is social reproduction, as a form of political identification. Um, and uh, these uh, opinions, uh, um, uh, in this opinion, uh, uh, tell that there is nothing actually radical but the approach itself, that social reproduction itself doesn't contain any, anything radical by itself. So I hope that Titi will have uh, some comments and uh, answers to this uh, criticism. Uh, so tonight's talk will be on a wave of international feminist struggles that have been rearticulating the idea of strike as a tool for anti-capitalist struggle in time of global crisis and as a tool for paving new directions for different lives on this planet. Uh, I guess this is enough for like a short introduction. Uh, Titi, the floor, floor is yours. In the next uh, 15 minutes, uh, you will hear about the new wave of international family struggles. Thank you for coming. So thank you, Anna, for that very kind uh, introduction. And I'd like to thank all of you to, uh, for coming here at 9 p.m. on a very, very cold day after obviously being in the festival or being part of organizing the festival all day. So thank you for coming. I want to thank particularly um, Carolina Herger, not only for uh, translating uh, the manifesto, but also for um, 
taking the lead in inviting me. Um, I see lots of friends and comrades in the audience, and I look forward to making more uh, friends and collaborators um, for my stay in Zagreb. So thank you very much for inviting me. I want to start by uh, perhaps responding very briefly to where Anna left off about the sort of criticisms um, of social reproduction theory as theory and as uh, a theory that can be employed to both make sense of our current world, but also to try to change it. Um, and we, we're going to talk more in detail about social reproduction theory throughout the lecture, but uh, my first response to the um, criticisms is for all of you to know that um, the one um, approach or of the criticism to SR social reproduction theory is that it's not Marxist enough. Okay, so that's one approach which uh, you may have heard at this festival. The other approach is to social reproduction theory that was um, articulated in uh, radical philosophy recently is that it is too Marxist. So for a section of the Marxist uh, um, world, social reproduction is not Marxist enough, and for a section of the feminist world, social reproduction theory is just too Marxist. So I think I'm in a very comfortable position of um, not being adequate for both camps because it gives us a perfect opportunity to actually talk about what we learn from both of these traditions and how to have two counterpost traditions of Marxism and feminism is actually a problem, okay? And part of the project of social reproduction theory is to solve that hyphen, all that problem between Marxism and, and feminism. So having said that, I do want to talk about the strike wave. And through the um, understanding of the strike wave right now to approach these questions of larger questions of Marxist theory. So this year, as many of you probably know, marks the centenary of Rosa Luxemburg's murder. This is also the year that we are experiencing a global return of working class resistance to austerity. So it is thus the perfect time to reread Luxembourg's extraordinary essay, The Mass Strike, to help us a century later to reflect on the strike form to reawaken to the vision of emancipation through the self-activity of the working class. And um, in Luxembourg, as those of you who know her work, you know that the term class struggle comes um, is is central to to that understanding of understand, uh, of of getting rid of uh, capitalism, um, and we also know there is a section of political struggles that commonsensically is referred to as feminist struggles. So these two kind of categories of struggle, feminist struggle and class struggle, are often linked together with either an and feminist struggle and class struggle, or with a versus, feminist struggle versus class struggle. So it is either conjunction or it is adversarial. So the problem here is this kind of a non-relational um, categorization of both kinds of struggle that I think uh, social reproduction theory is trying to explore and actually um, reject. And the perfect way to enter that, again, is through the strike form. Um, so one of the things that we should be aware of is that in large swaths of the neoliberal globe, capital has spent the last 40 years perfecting mechanisms to ensure the virtual impossibility of strikes. According to statistics kept by, for instance, the International Trade Union Confederation, last year alone, 81 of countries had violated, 81% uh, of countries had violated the right to collective bargaining, while 65% of countries had passed laws to deny workers the right to a trade union. 
which is an increase of 60% uh, uh, from 60% in 2017. These legal means to ban strikes are frequently supplemented by open violence, with trade union activists being routinely killed in several parts of the world. The, um, the same International Trade Union Confederation recorded an increase in incidents of violence against labor leaders from 59 in 2017 to 65 in 2018. Such direct attempts to prevent collective action are bolstered by the obstacles that derive from the very workings of the capital labor relation. So one is the obstacles presented by the bosses and the capitalist state, but the other obstacles are actually inherent to the capital labor relationships. Divisions exist between working people on the basis of race, gender, ethnicity, to name only a few, because in the real world, capitalist social relations produce people at different levels of abjection, from the hospitals, or lack thereof, where they're born, the schools they can access as children, to the houses and neighborhoods they live in, the working class have different life experiences, even if they share a common workplace. These life experiences then create the conditions for differential wage structures, which in turn socially reproduce these existing inequalities. Once we attend to this totality of capitalist malefaction, normative and exceptional, we can begin to appreciate the enormity of obstacles workers overcome when they strike. But a strike does not express collectivity, it builds it. The new collective once engendered is neither constant nor a simple numerical collection of workers, but rather is, any, in any successful strike uh, context, it is always solidarity in process. You have to constantly build and rebuild solidarity through the process of building and, uh, and spreading the strike. When life stories of police violence or immigration raids are shared through the template of the strike form, it does not simply strengthen solidarity, but can reconfigure the horizons of the strike itself. So for instance, the first of the wave of teacher strike um, in the US that, happened, that started uh, last spring, one of the first um, school districts and states to go on strike in the US was West Virginia. So I I went and spent uh, several days in West Virginia talking to the teachers who were on strike. Now, the list of demands they had were very specific to the strike itself. But this year, LA student, uh, teachers, the teachers in Los Angeles went on strike and won. So they had a very different experience and had a very different set of demands. So from West Virginia last year to LA this year, the strike movement or the form of the strike had grown and learned. So one of the first demands that the LA teachers had was the right of immigrant kids not to be uh, deported by the immigration authorities. That was part of their strike demand. So in a way, the horizon of the strike actually blossomed and were expanded through the strike itself. A strike wave, of course, requires a scalar uh, enhancement of these practices. Multiple life histories and specific workplace injustices have to be gathered and gleaned in order to produce a common fighting narrative, not a commonality that ignores the specific stories and need, but again, a solidarity in process where particular harms are addressed through collective action. We are, as many of you know, currently in the midst of an international strike wave by teachers. From Tunisia to Tamil Nadu, from Brazil to Mexico, and most notably all over the United States, there is a combative strike movement developing with teachers at the head of it. It is, however, not a coincidence that this sector of work with its female majority workforce, has emerged as one of the most militant sites for the global struggle against austerity. For 40 years, 
neoliberalism has systematically corroded institutions that the working class needs for its life making. So the central understanding here, it's probably good to remind ourselves that the central understanding of social reproduction theory is that if capitalism is a system that is, that is dependent on the production of commodities, it is commodities and the surplus value uh, created through the production of commodities that is the lifeblood of the system, then social reproduction theory asks two questions. One, who produces the commodities, which is workers? And then a related question, if workers produce those commodities in order to keep the system running, who produces the workers, okay? So all the life processes that are needed for the reproduction of the workers' labor power are central um, questions and concerns for social reproduction theory. So this process of the reproduction of life, uh, of labor power is what in shorthand, I'm calling life-making processes, okay? So it's not just the biological reproduction of life, but it is also the building of capacities for uh, a person in order to be able to sell their labor power in, in the market. So for 40 years, neoliberalism has actually attacked those institutions that are needed for working class life-making. Food and fuel subsidies have been removed public food distribution systems dismantled, hospitals and schools privatized, even public parks have been starved of funds and municipal councils forced to reconsider selling these green spaces. What emerged in the wake of such predation were communities and children abandoned by the state, haunted by darkening futures, in neighborhoods of boarded up houses and flourishing pawn shops. In such communities, the act and practice of care was and remains a political act. As austerity abrased away the infrastructures necessary for the reproduction of a life of dignity, the restoration of care emerged as the key battle against capital. It is of course obvious that due to the historically determined gender division of labor, care work in the home is mostly performed by women or gender non-conforming people. In the United States, the current statistics is women perform nine hours more of domestic labor than men. Nine hours is a lot of hours, comrade. Um, similarly, professions that encapsulate the spirit of care work, teaching, nursing, home care, often have a disproportionate number of female staff. What is of significance here, however, is not just women perform care work, but the political meaning and dimensions of what I am including under the care rubric. Care, I submit, should not be seen in its individual manifestation alone where someone, often a woman, provides care for an ailing body, a needy child, or a hungry family. In calling care a political act under neoliberalism, I am referring to all acts and professions whose projects it is to reduce the injuries of class. Thus, public schools that aim to better the life chances of working class children public parks, which can be restorative for their families, hospitals, where working class lives can be repaired and rebuilt, are all instances of care in this political sense. All these services and infrastructures are those that are vital for the production of people, not just for reprodu reproducing their lives, but also for building capacities and attributes that are essential to the human condition. Locating care as one of the most political responses to austerity helps us understand better the connecting tissue between the various women-led movements of recent years. 
from the Argentine mass strikes against gender violence, the immense movement against water privatization in Ireland, to the current wave of teacher strikes and feminist strikes, we can finally see them as driven by the same force, the need to establish a new common good. This new wave of struggle has also managed to blur the dangerous border between class struggle and feminist struggle fostered by many generations of the left. Consider the points of political convergence between the worldwide walkouts of Google employees against sexual harassment or the Glasgow walkout of um, uh, Glasgow Council walkouts by a strike by women and the international women's strike movement that began on March 8, 2017. While the Google walkouts or the Glasgow strikes were cited in workplaces, the March 8th movement has been on the streets. But both movements are predicated upon an explicitly feminist agenda. Most importantly, these braided strands of struggle have altered the boundaries of what counts as a feminist issue. Traditionally, feminist concerns have often be, been limited to issues such as abortion rights and sexual harassment or sexual violence. But this new class struggle feminism, however, has moved the compass from effects to causes of gender discrimination. Thus, the new movement is as intransigent against gender violence as it is against immigration laws that enforce precarity on migrant women and expose them to praying managers and bosses. Similarly, this new generation of feminists refuse to accept equal pay with men when both wages are low. Rather, the movement has enlarged the purview of feminism to address universal issues of wages, healthcare, and police violence. Hence, while many of these protests are about better pay or cost reduction for particular services, they must not be seen in their outward form, but in their inner essence as movements against neoliberal rapacity and for restoring care to working class lives. We know by now that austerity and life are in a deadly opposition. The social capacities with which we make life and the institutions with which we maintain life and satisfy our needs are increasingly under threat. From conditions of birth such as reproductive rights, access to health care, to simple provisions that can ensure dignity in old age, such as pensions, social security. The life cycle of the majority is now punctuated by a ghoulish metronome of food shortage, poisoned water, and school closures. In decimating social provisioning, capitalism undermines our collective life-making. But that harm is no longer limited to the social alone. Capitalism's relentless productivist drive has now triggered climate change, threatening all life as we know it. How then do we take our lives back? Here I would like to suggest three starting points. One is that we try to reconsider the question of wealth, from a wealth of things to how to redefine wealth. Because capitalism has always promised us a higher living standards than any economic system before, understood as a plenitude of things. We need a redefinition of wealth and the invention of new means of creating it. I am from India, so <laughs> um, 
the Nehruvian vision of the, uh, of the free India, uh, post-colonial India, um, as understood as uh, production was literally that Nehru said that uh, dams and factories were the temples of new India. So it was almost a religious rhetoric that the higher the smokestacks, the more prosperity we were going to get. The more factories, the more things, and the more we will uh, get rid of poverty. And you can see for a country of the global south just coming out of a colonial struggle, this is a very attractive vision that we are finally going to have a plenitude of things. But when we think about the accumulation drive of capitalism and what it is doing to our environment, it is necessary to reimagine um, this tethering of wealth to a plenitude of things. Jobs, we are told, for instance, are our only means of creating wealth or assuring economic growth. The regime of work under capitalism is such that the wage appears as an end in itself rather than a means to a life of dignity. If we recognize the wage for what it is, a forced historical intervention between the laboring human and her life, then we can think about new ways to irrigate that life. This means we can demand that the labor of society be reorganized around jobs that enrich life, rather than be harnessed in the irrational production of endless commodities. Paying close attention to the dark histories of racial and gender inequalities on this planet, we must ensure that we do not simply talk about creating green jobs, but seek to link the jobs program to multiple forms of social sustain sustainability in ways that such jobs can become tools to counteract systemic injustices rather than reproduce them. Schools and hospitals, public housing and transport, all such projects that sustain and improve the social reproduction of life are not simply our means to an ecologically viable future. They are also spaces which can allow us to imagine an alternative vision of wealth and experiment in ways in which human labor can be employed for the production of solidarities, mutual pleasures, and beauty. We must reorganize then social reprodu reproduction, but how exactly? And here, global movements demanding social provisioning that we talked about all the strikes, the women-led movements, which are often you know, led by women, should be seen as tentative blueprints in three crucial ways of how we should reorganize social reproduction. First, because these movements give us a sense of what kind of social goods any Green New Deal needs to reclaim for the many. Second, because of the scale and militancy of these strikes and protests, they provide roadmaps for how to get them. In other words, you're not going to have a Green New Deal simply by electing lots of radical people to the Senate or the Parliament. A Green New Deal has to be also one on the streets. Finally, because these movements model a politics of what I call insurgent caring, whereby movements demand that care be provided at multiple scales of life, individual, community, and planetary. Globally, then, there has been an explosion of movements demanding care understood in the most expansive sense for working class communities. In the global north, we have workplace struggles of migrant workers who perform the bulk of care work in homes and hospitals, alongside, as we saw, a growing strike wave led by teachers and nurses. These are joined by community struggles for clean water and clean air, most often led by communities of color, exposing the deliberate racialized poisoning of the environment by capital. 
in the global south, sustained women-led movements against extractive industries and massive dam building projects have shattered the developmentalist model as the singular road to a prosperous future. These movements are integrating the defense of nature to the material well-being of human communities, reaffirming that the fate of the social world and the natural world are now co-constitutive. These insurgent care struggles build from each other. They're anabolic in nature, both politically through solidarities and conceptually because social and ecological issues now chronically embed one another. Let's take, for instance, protests led by indigenous Dumagat women against the Kaliwa Dam in the Philippines. So as you probably know, that uh, the leader of the Philippines is Duterte, who is an arch neoliberal right-wing populist, right? So this, uh, these protests led by the indigenous women actually pose a threat to the Duterte regime as well as to the entwined crimes of territorial dispossession, climate crisis, and gender violence. So how? How, how are all these projects, for instance, linked together, and how does protesting against one dam then try to break the chains in all these other ways? So this is a multi-million dollar dam project to be built by Duterte, but with a loan from the Chinese government. So there is imperial money involved here as well. Now the dam itself will destabilize the ecosystem of the Sierra Madre forest, displace hundreds of indigenous communities from their ancestral land, and create conditions of extreme poverty and insecurity for women of these communities. And these conditions, as we know, are the breeding ground for gender and intimate violence. Kake Tolentino, a member of the Dumaga tribe and the national coordinator of the Bi Indigenous Women Network, captured this connection perfectly when she pointed out, and I quote, we are impoverished and made landless because of the plunder of our ancestral lands. These are the biggest forms of violence against indigenous women that should be put to an end. So she is basically drawing our attention that intimate violence is not the only form of violence. This kind of dispossession is a kind of violence that is actually the context for the production also of intimate violence. So just as capitalist predation on land and life have cascading effects of harm on each other, these movements to recenter social reproductive care have the potential to reduce such harms in scalar ways. In identifying climate crisis as a threat multiplier, um, then these movements, um, any Green New Deal must enshrine this movement understanding that climate change can only be confronted through social change. It therefore has the potential only then of inciting movements rather than containing them. Capitalism as a system is future blind. It can and will sabotage its own conditions of possibility in its drive to accumulate for accumulation's sake. This we know. The constant push to increase productivity is intrinsically linked to this constant sense of accelerated time and the use of fossil fuels drives this perpetual speed up. Now, climate change has set a limit on how much longer this kind of production is possible. The system and the planet with it is experiencing time in radically transformed ways. If capitalist production is concerned only with a constant, flattened, present time of profit, social reproduction as theory and practice directs our attention to the future, to the ongoing reproduction of life of the species and the social world we create in and from the natural world. The continued reproduction of capitalism is now threatening the reproduction of actual life. 
So in practice, a politics for social reproduction must be able to demonstrate that a just transition is capable of creating sustainable habitats where working class lives can flourish. Capitalism has stunted our imagination about the possibilities of public goods, conjuring up visions of housing projects in ruins or crumbling subway systems infested with rats. But we can actually combine a job creation program with beautifully planned housing projects in walkable, democratically planned communities. We can fight for our public parks, for music, and for theater programs. But according primacy to a politics of life making, such as we are trying to elaborate here, will of course come into conflict with the imperatives of profit making. The reordering of social reproduction in this manner will require reducing the working hours of uh, working class people and dismantling the military and carceral functions of the state in favor of social provisioning ones. Undergirding any just transition, therefore, must be robust working class organizing in unions, communities, and streets. So this is the moment when we must reject any analytical separation between workplace and non-workplace struggles, between labor struggles and community struggles. Because all struggles of the exploited and the oppressed, whether within or outside of workplaces, are animated by the politics and ethics of insurgent care. Workers demand better wages and benefits to better care for their own lives and those that they love, and communities struggle against the violence of the state or mining companies in order to bring safety and care to their people. There's a beautiful um, uh, American folk song from the 1920s and 30s, the height of the um, uh, minor struggles in, in the US um, where, when unions are strong. Uh, and it says, uh, shoes, sh the refrain of the song is, why are we striking? And the refrain is, shoes, shoes, we are striking for pairs of shoes. Or milk, milk, we are striking for milk for our kids. So in other words, we are not striking for wage increase. That is simply a means to life. We are actually striking for better lives. So it really Caps, uh, captures beautifully what working class struggles are about, whereas uh, business unionism uh, in the global north has deracinated that understanding of working class struggles, making it only about the contract wage battle and, um, and understanding of the wage simply as a raise or, or simply as benefits. A politics informed by such a narrow separation between workplace and non-workplace struggles is actually dangerous for our climate unstable times. Such a set of politics, for instance, will fail to mobilize labor unions in defense of climate migrants from the global south to the north, where compassion will be needed, only competition will be perceived. Struggles that confront climate change, therefore, have the greatest potential of fusing struggles against production, labor struggles with the struggles against the effects of such production, which is movements for clean air or racial justice. The recent wave of feminist strikes, teacher strikes, and children's strikes are the most remarkable examples of such fusion. We are only now witnessing, as we started to say at the start of this lecture, we are only now witnessing the beginnings of what might become a global revolt against austerity. But the labor movement must be politicized beyond its trade union expression. The class as a whole, its wages and pensions, as well as its homes and playgrounds, must be defended against the ravages of capitalism. For this to happen, there needs to develop and spread what Rosa Luxemburg has called a class feeling. This is her term. We need class feeling, which allowed Russian workers in 1905 to see every 
impartial question of any small group of workers as a general question, as a class affair, unquote, which in turn provoked such workers to react to its influence as a unity. This is yet to be. This class feeling is yet to be engendered in the working class or the global working class as a whole. As a left, we sense it's coming. As revolutionaries, we must ensure its success. Thank you. Thank you, Titi, so much for this very inspiring talk. Um, we have been discussing here for the last two days on the forum um, issues that could be late, related to what you have been uh, speaking about. And I'm very sure that uh, all of you are burning to ask questions uh, to Titi. So you're very welcome. Um, please uh, come out with your comments and questions. Can I add something to that? Um, it would be great if you asked a question so I can clarify things that uh, was perhaps not clear in the presentation. But even if you don't have a question, I'd love to hear about movements you are involved in um, which are, have some kind of resonance with the kind of movements I've been talking about. So I'd love to hear from you and learn from your movements. Well, if you don't have any questions in one... Okay, we have one question here. Uh, hi, I'm Marina. I would just have one short question. Uh, in your uh, last few sentences, you mentioned uh, class feeling. That probably resonates with class consciousness. Uh, but uh, what, what, what would be the difference, what would be the similarity, and why you chose that term, not consciousness? Class feeling. Um, so that's not my term. It's Rosa Luxemburg's term, class feeling. So she's talking, she, she was writing about the 1905 strike um, movement in Russia, and she, what class feeling, class feeling can only come from heightened class consciousness, okay? So to answer your question very shortly, but what she means by class feeling is um, that once there is a mass strike, once there's a strike wave, you know, across the country, as it were, in a vast country like Russia, what Luxembourg is uh, drawing attention to is then one workplace issue, let's say the sexism of managers in one factory in Petrograd, right? Then that particular issue becomes the general issue for the movement as a whole, right? And then the movement as a whole responds to that issue of sexism in that factory as a general sense, as, as a unitary force. And this class feeling she's talking about can only come when the strike movement has spread and developed and attained a particular kind of uh, level of heightened class consciousness. So that's what she uh, is referring to. So imagine in our situation, right? So I can only talk about two, well, three countries really. One is the United States, the UK, and India, the three countries that I grew up or lived in. Um, so imagine uh, the question of, say, for instance, sexual violence, right? So sexual violence as an issue is left to be dealt by the feminist movement, as it were, right? So this is something, a, a Me Too or anti-rape culture movement is sort of the business of the feminist movement. But imagine how strong a movement for, um, um, against these sort of anti-abortion laws, against um, uh, gender violence would be if all the existing unions of the country basically said, we will, not, uh, we will ask our members not to go to work until we, you withdraw this particular law 
um, which is criminalizing abortion, right? So that that is what we what Luxembourg is referring to as a class feeling that a, that a single issue becomes the concern of the class as a whole, and the class as a whole responds to it. And and the 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 most beautiful slogan that encapsulates that kind of a practice is an injury to one is an injury to all, right? Which was one of the um, animating slogans of the labor movement. Uh, thank you so much, Titi, for, for a really in inspiring um, and important talk, uh, I would say. Um, I would like to stir a pot a little bit and just maybe to uh, ask you to clarify a bit um, about the sentence you started with, the one uh, social production theory is not Marxist enough, but then again is to Marxist. Maybe just a few sentences about that. And uh, other question is um, more a theoretical one. Uh, do you think that social production theory, I think you, you think, okay, do you think that social production theory is the most valid analytical instrument um, which helps us to explain uh, the gender oppression, and uh, how would you use it in terms of maybe even critique of intersectionality or just um, uh, identity level of understanding uh, which avoids a bit uh, a class struggles? And then again, uh, if this is like a, a theoretical level of the question, maybe a more political one might be, is um, social reproduction theory a kind of a political translation, um, uh, especially in terms of strikes? Can we say that the strikes, the women's strikes, are actually a political translation of social reproduction theory? Thank you, Ankita. That, that's a fantastic question, and I, I hope I can do it justice in, in, in a short um, <laughs> response. So the, the first part, uh, not Marxist enough and not feminist enough. So the not Marxist enough is obviously um, based on an erroneous understanding of social reproduction theory, that social reproduction theorists um, of my kind of social reproduction theory, if, if you like, that we um, s attribute value or surplus value to domestic labor, that we argue that domestic labor creates surplus value. We don't. And, uh, you know, it, w when people say um, orthodox Marxists criticize social reproduction theory, I find that a very strange statement because I consider myself a pretty orthodox Marxist. So, you know, um, social reproduction theory actually hews very, very close to and is very faithful to Capital Volume 1 and to the labor theory of value in general. We do not, I mean, um, you probably are very familiar with the literature, but for others, if you really want to uh, read a very, very good analysis of why uh, domestic labor does not create value in the Marxist sense, it's by Paul Smith. Um, and and it's, it's an essay from the 1970s, and he goes through in a, in a very, very good way uh, why a domestic labor doesn't create value. Value. Now, uh, please, uh, comrades, please do not misunderstand value in the colloquial uh, linguistic sense of the term, okay? Because Rosa Luxemburg actually has a wonderful passage on this. It's not, domestic labor doesn't create value, does not mean in the English sense that domestic labor is not valuable, okay? It just means that it doesn't create value or export, uh, or surplus value in the Marxist sense. So it's, a, it's used as an analytical category, not as a valuable or invaluable, because uh, even Marx acknowledges very, very clearly that domestic labor is very valuable. In fact, I think one of the things that social reproduction theory does is talks about the actual valuable nature of domestic labor because it's a presupposition to the production of value, right? So the production of surplus value. So without this work, there would not be any labor power and thereby there would not be any production of commodities or the production of value. So, so it's a presupposition rather than the production of value itself. So that's how I think it's not Marxist enough, does not stand as, 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 a, as, a, as a challenge to it. The not feminist enough, um, you know, is I think 
is actually on the same question. So the, the radical philosophy pieces, if you've had a chance to look at it, says that the problem with social reproduction theory is that we do not, uh, we do not countenance that domestic labor produces value. Okay, that we do not agree that, and unless we agree that domestic labor produces value, then of course we are being too Marxist and not feminist. Again, I think this is, um, I, I, th I think this is a good debate. It's a productive debate that we need to have with our feminist uh, comrades, uh, this kind of group of feminist comrades about uh, housework and domestic labor. Because again, the question is not that it is not valuable. But the question is, what kind of work does it do for capital, okay? And there, I think social reproduction theory is very clear that it is, um, Capital Volume 1 is one of my favorite books. You know, if you were to ask me sort of desert island, what books will you take? Volume 1 would be one of it, absolutely, no question. And volume one has, the, 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 the problem of vol volume one, I suppose, would be that it has a tremendous undeveloped insight, okay? So it's, it's not that that insight is lacking, but it, that insight is undeveloped in volume one. And actually, you can't blame Charlie Marx for it because he didn't finish the project, right? So maybe it would have been developed in further volumes, but also Marxism is a living theory. Why should we expect Marx to develop all of it? I mean, it's also up to us uh, to develop uh, 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 Marxism and, and take it further. So the underdeveloped insight is this which is Marxism talks about the circuit of commodity production, okay? But there is a second circuit, which is the production of uh, labor, uh, is the reproduction of labor power, okay? So one circuit is the production of commodities, the other circuit is the reproduction of labor power. Now, traditionally, a, a branch of feminists have seen those circuits as separate. So this is why they call it the dual system, okay? So one system produces exploitation, commodities, etc., and the other system is patriarchy, and it creates uh, gender, racial uh, oppression, and so on. Social reproduction theory says, no, the, the positing of the two circuits is simply for analytical purposes. There's actually not two circuits. There's only one circuit simultaneously, on the one hand, producing commodities, and on the other, side, um, on the other hand, reproducing labor power. They are discrete only in their spatial separation because of the way capital posits itself. Right? But analytically, they are co-constitutive. And this is something that is absolutely at the heart of social reproduction theory, that the two circuits are co-constitutive. Okay? So changes in one is bound to affect changes in the other, and vice versa. Right? So this is, um, this is something that um, I think is, is a real uh, challenge for us to push further and develop further. So social reproduction theory, for instance, you know, I, I'm very proud of the book I edited. I'm very proud of the work that some of you guys are doing as comrades and activists, but it is also, there is a lot of work to be done in taking the theory and pushing it further. So for instance, one of the things that we should be thinking about is uh, what is the relationship, how, how do we theorize the state, the capitalist state, through the framework of social reproduction theory, right? So there are many, many areas. Uh, so one of the things I'm trying to think about is how do we think of climate change through the question of social reproduction theory? And some of those ideas I presented to you, how we can think about a Green New Deal or et cetera through uh, social reproduction theory. But you, the, I, I'll end by saying the, the question that you ask about the feminist strike is absolutely vital because the feminist strike actually expresses social reproduction theory in practice. So the feminist strike, and this is what the book really is about, because the book is not 
three clever people coming up with the idea of feminism for the 99%. The book is about expressing what activists and feminist leaders on the ground are already doing. And all we are doing really is cohering that politics and representing here. So it's not really theory from the academy to explain the streets. In fact, it is the streets teaching us about how to understand the current moment of neoliberal austerity struggles and, and, and uh, ways to, to defeat them. So how does the feminist strike actually express social reproduction theory? Because the feminist strikes acknowledge that labor performed by women and gender non-conforming people is not limited to the sphere of production alone. Okay, and so when you withdraw your labor, you need to withdraw it not just in the workplace, but also in the sphere of the production of reproduction of labor power. So a feminist strike does not just say, we will not go to work, we will not drive our buses, your buses, we will not turn your uh, electricity on, okay? It doesn't just say that, it says that, and it says, we will not have sex with you, we will not smile at you, and we will not let your make us do the work of childcare and cooking, okay? So this is both challenging the productive relations of capital as well as the presuppositions that create those productive relations. So this is why I think the feminist strike is absolutely crucial uh, to express the real, um, violence of neoliberal austerity, as well as the real potential of how to challenge that. Thank you. Are there any other questions from you? If not, I have a um, couple of questions. Um, so one of the uh, one of my questions is dealing with the, the term itself that you decided to use the term coined by Nancy Fraser is feminism for the 99%. So I would be interesting, uh, and I was wondering, um, uh, is this class solidarity actually possible in, if we have in mind these different socio-economical structures within 99%? Uh, Here I have in mind like the different positions of, let's say, engineers, scientists, and popularized working class. So feminism for the 99% is a mobilizing slogan. It is not a literal slogan, right? So first, we have to keep that in mind. That's one. Second, so it must be created rather than assumed. The second is, what is working class solidarity or unity? One problem of understanding working class solidarity and unity is that working class solidarity is assumed. So we know commonsensically often in sort of older Marxist organizations or groups, um, we are told that class is the basis of unity while oppression is the basis of division, okay? so. It is through class struggle that the working class unites, while through oppression struggles reveal the, the fissures in the working class. Well, first of all, it's completely untrue because uh, class divides pretty badly. It's called the labor market, hello. So the labor market is an extremely segmented um, uh, se uh, you know, uh, arena where the working class is divided according to class. So, but that aside, uh, so, Feminism, uh, so the question of building solidarity must be a building in process. It cannot be assumed, okay? You cannot go in and say that this strike is a strike for wages, so questions of race and gender cannot come into it. That's an assumption based on an absolute um, false universality, which is actually heteronormative or white in the case of, is a case of uh, the US. I'll give you a concrete example. So this is part of uh, my work um, with uh, striking teachers. So last year, right after uh, West Virginia, it was Kentucky that, went, that uh, went on strike, okay? So Kentucky is a largely white state, but there are certain towns in Kentucky, like Louisville, which is, has a high black population, okay? 
So Kentucky, the state legislature, was passing a bill which was going to attack the wages and pensions of the teachers, which is why the teachers' union was calling for uh, uh, action against that. But the same legislature, during the same session, was passing a bill called the criminal bill, which would criminalize two or three groups of people standing together. So it's loitering, OK? And that kind of a criminal bill, for those of you not familiar with the US, that is coded racist bill, OK? That kind of a bill is only um, attempt, uh, is an attempt to, um, um, to target black communities. And the, the purpose of the bill was that if we see three or four people congregating in, in, a, in a place, we're going to immediately do a drug search, OK? Now, you will, be, um, you will have double the, um, the sentence if you're caught with even an ounce of marijuana while you're standing this way. So again, you know, the history of the drug wars against black communities, this was clearly a bill attacking uh, the black population of uh, Kentucky. And actually, uh, there are um, uh, precedents for this kind of bill passed previously in Virginia with the exact same language of trying to uh, keep the public peace against criminal elements, OK? So black teachers in the union basically said, look, we have a collective struggle right now against the attack on our wages and pensions. We have all come together to fight and to possibly have a, have a strike. This is our opportunity to also challenge this racist bill, which targets uh, students of color and teachers of color, right? The union leadership said no. We cannot target this bill because it only affects a tiny section of the population and it will divide the movement because it's not about white teachers at all. So that kind of an assumption of unity, that class is about the majority, while the minority concerns should be fought elsewhere, is precisely the kind of approach that actually breaks uh, class power and class solidarity. Feminism for the 99% is actually saying that unity cannot be assumed. Unity and solidarity must be in process and must be built within struggles, okay? So this is again coming back to the question of class feeling that the particular struggles and the particular harms must be addressed as a collective uh, response to it. Any other questions? Uh, yes, yes, okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so intersectionality. Hmm. Okay, so there is, a, just talk about intersectionality. Uh, there is a very good chapter in the book I edited on intersectionality by David McNally that I would encourage uh, uh, comrades to take a look at. But um, whenever I'm asked about intersectionality, I have to start with the comment about how intersectionality is understood by the movement. Okay, this is a separate argument about the theory of intersectionality. First, let's try to understand how intersectionality is understood in the movement. And this is a very crucial point, because in the United States, um, I don't know about the UK or elsewhere, but in the United States, from where intersectionality originates, but in the United States, intersectionality um, is, is a, um, is a stand-in word for anti-racism. Okay, so on your college campus or in your community, if there is a young feminist who calls herself intersectional feminist, you can be pretty sure that this is a person you want to work with, you want to cultivate, and you want to treasure because she is actually talking about anti-racist feminism, uh, and her language for that is intersectional feminism. Okay, so so that is the movement expression, which I think we should celebrate and, and, uh, and honor. 
But then there's the question of the theoretical uh, um, underpinnings of intersectionality. And there, I think I disagree with intersectionality as a theory. Um, I, again, uh, to, um, to have another sort of caveat, I suppose, is intersectional feminists have given us some of the richest descriptions of multiple oppression. Okay, so the descriptive power of intersectional feminists have been tremendous in um, guiding us and in trying to um, draw our attention to the multiple forms of oppression um, uh, um, experienced by women globally, not just in the United States. So the, as a description, it's beautiful and rich and urgent. But as an explanatory tool, it does not give us an explanation why these multiple oppressions arise or what is the logic of their intersection, okay? And unless we understand that, it is impossible for us to understand how to fight through it, okay? So for instance, there is no, um, there is no clear understanding as to why uh, race, gender, or ability intersect in the way they do, because the intersection is seen as completely arbitrary. So there is no logic to it. We need to understand what the logic of the intersection is. For instance, there is also no explanation as to where new oppressions arise from. Where, where do new oppressions arise from if everything is already in this sort of two-dimensional grid of intersectional um, uh, um, oppressions. So these are some of the basic theoretical uh, problems of intersectionality as a theory to explain the totality of, of uh, um, uh, capitalist uh, reproduction of itself and of multiple um, oppressions. And that's where I think social reproduction theory is a more useful tool in, in trying to uh, explain oppression and its relationship to explo exploitation rather than intersectionality. Thank you. Any other questions? No? If not, uh, I have one last question, I promise. <laughs> I mean, being myself the, the person of the movement, uh, I was uh, wondering about your experience in organizing women's strike in the US in 2017 and after that, and what were the, the difficulties and uh, what are the, the gains of uh, those, uh, this uh, huge movement that you managed to, to organize? So um, the beginnings of the strike, um, I don't know if um, comrades here know about this. So um, 2016, there were two major uprisings um, against um, austerity, capitalism, whatever you want to call it. One was Argentina, uh, neo Naminos against femicide and gender violence. The other was Poland, um, against uh, the criminalization of abortion, okay? So both of these countries, Argentina and Poland, had literally hundreds of thousands of people on the streets and shut down entire countries, okay? So that was in 2016. So in the fall of 2016, some of us started talking to each other internationally about whether it was possible to imagine an international women's strike. Uh, on the, uh, based on the inspiration from these two uh, major uh, uprisings. And so that conversation started in the fall of 2016. And as you know, in the United States, something pretty massive happened in the fall of 2016, which was November, the election of Donald Trump. No one expected it. Nobody expected Trump to be elected. Everyone thought it was going to be Hillary. And we thought, you know, our battle was going to be very different if Hillary was uh, uh, elected. Uh, so one of the uh, slogans uh, we had in the strike was, we are not just against Trump, we are against the conditions that created Trump, which is, you know, a bipartisan, both Democrats and, and Republicans created those conditions. So. So in, the, uh, in January of 2017, uh, there was a massive women's march on Washington uh, that you may have uh, read about. And um, the first, I mean, the mobilization of the women's march in January was the most massive in 
the entire history of the United States, okay? So all over the country, women marched against the election of Donald Trump. But the politics that framed the women's march were pretty inchoate, okay? It was dominated by liberals, okay? So you had uh, um, Zionist uh, speakers on, on, the, on the platform. Uh, the representation was not as inclusive as you know, some of us would have liked. But then we also had our comrade Angela Davis just getting up there. No one tells Angela Davis what to do. So she just got up there and she said, freedom for Palestine, okay? And we all erupted in cheers, right? So this was the first time someone actually got up in a bloody uh, meeting of hundreds of thousands of people and said free Palestine and was broadcast all over national media. Okay, think about the kind of confidence that gives to anti-imperialism, right? So it was fantastic, but it was extremely inchoate and it did not have, you know, a strong set of politics, okay? And so those of us on the radical left then decided that we need a much clearer articulation of what feminism needs to be in this moment of danger, okay? And that's where we decided that it was time to strike uh, on March 8th through the, 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 the conversations we were having before on the international women's strike. And that's where uh, we wrote a, a call for a strike um, signed by Angela and Nancy and, and several others uh, calling for a feminism for the 99%, which was a very conscious call in order to challenge the feminism of the Hillary Clintons and the Sheryl Sandbergs. Because one of the choices we were being given once Trump was elected was here was an absolutely vile, monstrous, white, cisgendered, racist man. And the challenge to that must be successful corporate feminists, okay? So those were kind of our options. On the one hand, the right-wing racists, and on the other hand, the neoliberal appeasers of capital, okay? So feminism for the 99% was a refusal. Okay, it was the politics of refusal of both sides, that we did not want the anti-migrant, the pro-racist, and pro-capitalist, nor did we want the um, neoliberal version of capitalism, which says that a woman must operate the drone, a woman must close the borders, a woman must put children behind cages, okay? So that's the kind of feminism we reject, and we reject the racism. So that was the politics with which we started. We were astonished by the response to the strike. So the common understanding is that the strike wave of teachers began with West Virginia last spring. Actually, that's not true. The first strike that happened of teachers was on March 8th of 2017 as part of the international women's strike where three school districts, teachers simply called in sick and said we refuse to go to school. Okay, and this was in the states where union um, activity is illegal. Okay, in those three states to strike is illegal, you can go to prison, but on March 8th of 2017, mass teachers called in sick and said refuse to go to school, and they had to close the school districts down, okay? Uh, we had, um, we had wonderful um, response from the smallest of towns. In a small town uh, uh, in Indiana, the activists organized um, the, in this fantastic way, they created a letter, okay? And they put this letter on their um, website. And women could download this letter. The letter was a model letter written to your male companion or partner, which was, you know, uh, the, the central message of the letter was, honey, take care of the children today, I'm going on strike, okay? So it's basically an instruction to the men to take care of everything, the woman was gonna go on strike. So the activists in this town said, come and join the demonstration, and before you go, leave this letter on the dining room table for your male partner, right? So um, beautiful um, manifestations of what the strike could mean happened on the ground from 
just ordinary activists on the ground and they would write us letters and give us reports of how they were organizing the strike. It was very clear to us that there should not be, um, you know, sort of uh, intense centralized planning. What there should be is a central set of politics. Okay, so for instance, um, I was the one who wrote the, uh, the statement of principles of the international women's strike. So for instance, why the strike has to be anti-imperialist, why Palestine liberation has to be at the heart of it, this is a big issue in the US, uh, why sex work uh, uh, um, were our comrades, why trans rights were absolutely central. So those kind of issues, social provisioning, social reproduction, so those kind of issues were the central politics, but there was not going to be a central committee somewhere which was going to dictate to local activists as to how to organize their strike. As long as everyone agreed with these central principles, uh, which we collaborated in trying to discuss and, and reformulate, as long as you agreed with our politics, you can organize the strike in whatever manner your local community thinks is right. So some local communities organize the strike as a boycott of particular sexist um, uh, work uh, businesses in their local um, uh, community. Some um, uh, organized as discussion uh, groups in local campuses. Some as demonstrations. In New York, we had a, a demonst uh, we had a public march. Uh, of over 5,000 people. So it took different expressions in different parts of the country, but it, it was a very conscious decision not to give local activists rules of how to organize. We were gonna help them um, if, like we got these beautiful letters from some village, rural part of the US saying, I have never organized a demonstration before, tell us how to do it. So we had a how-to guide on our website, which was simply a, a guide, right? It wasn't like you have to do it this way. It was simply a guide for activists to, to follow. But we also learned from the activists the various innovative methods that they used to organize in, in their uh, area. So for instance, one of, the, one of the most precious letters we received was uh, this, um, uh, this nurse, okay? So she was an emergency room nurse, okay? And she said, that day I am in the emergency room, I cannot strike, I cannot leave my workplace because there are people on life support. So because I cannot strike, I want others to strike. So here is some money and on the day, I'm gonna wear red to stand in solidarity with the rest of you, right? So again, she, activists on the ground were inventing new ways to put solidarity in practice such that they could stand with the strike, right? So, and since 2017, the strike has a spread not only in new countries, so this year there's going to be strikes in Belgium and Switzerland, which did not exist before. Um, and the, the Spanish state, as you know, it, the strike was absolutely brilliant and massive. It closed down the, uh, the entire nation. Um, but we also need to have a conversation at this point as where to go after the strike. Right? So can this feminist movement be limited only to striking on March 8th, or can we talk about where to go after the strike? Right? So one of, the, um, one of the concepts that we've been discussing with our international strike comrades that uh, you know, I would love to discuss with you at some point is a question of a feminist international. Not like an international bureau or anything, nothing like that, but this kind of an international feminist movement, what are its scope and how do we push it forward? How do we expand its horizons? And most of all, how do we become strike ready to strike against capital? Thank you, Didi, so much for these important questions. Uh, I will end up uh, this evening. Thank you so much for being uh, such a patient audience, and thank you, Didi, for sharing your experience and your research. Thank you.